Hello there. Welcome to my channel. You know, on this channel, we focus not exclusively, but predominantly on e-ink note-taking devices. That's kind of my area of specialty. I've used a number of them over the years and tested even more. And I have a pretty good sense of, you know, what's available, what's good and what isn't. And so that's what my review series and my channel is generally about. But one of the things I wanted to do and focus on in this particular video is just take a few steps away from all that detail and just give kind of a high level overview of some tips that anyone who's new to this space, and I suppose to some degree people that might be somewhat experienced as well, um, can take in mind as they consider what might be the right device for them. So what I'm going to go over in these seven tips are things that I think are uh, things that you should either downplay or not focus on or uh, other things that you should be more concerned about and why. So I'm trying to give a framework to make it a little bit easier for you, not necessarily to make your final decision on what device might be right for you, but to at least know where to look without having to have the burden of having you know, too much research to do to figure out what e-ink device may be great for your situation. Now, let's just really quickly go over what e-ink is good for. It's this technology that is uh, much better in many respects to LCD screens as it relates in particular to reading and writing. Now, it's not that LCD screens, and think of like an Apple, for example, or what have you, um, aren't you know, useful for those types of purposes, but um, over longer periods of time, e-ink tends to be more conducive to more comfortable reading and has a much more, you know, not exact, but much more paper-like experience than certainly what you get on doing any type of writing of notes by hand on an LCD type of a screen. So there's definitely advantages, and there's more than that, but those are just generally speaking why you might be interested in looking at an e-ink device. You know, the classic example with reading, of course, is Kindle. You know, Kindle has really revolutionized uh, the space and really brought this technology into the forefront, and note-taking, I think, can play a similar role. So as the Kindle is better, in my opinion, than reading books and is superior, not everyone agrees with that, but I think that's the case, then I think that's the same analogy between you know, note-taking on paper or on an LCD screen versus an e-ink screen. It's that type of a difference. So before we get into the seven tips themselves, I just wanna really emphasize and do a disclaimer, I suppose, that these are high level generalities. I'm just trying to find and make statements that are mostly true, may not always be true. And there might be circumstances for certain people where something that I might dismiss or highlight isn't important to them or is more important to them. You know, there, there's always gonna be 5% of the population that has very specific use cases where maybe my generalities won't apply. But that's always the caveat. But in order to simplify things, you do have to kind of strip things down. And that's what I'm going to be doing today. And I'll try to highlight where there might be certain contra points, um, at least as I see them. If I miss any, please put those into the comments for uh, newcomers to read as well. And when having uh, said all that, let's go ahead and dive on into my seven tips for newcomers. A lot of these tips focus on the hardware side. And that's because the class of e-ink devices that we're talking about kind of operate on a little bit of a different plane, if you will, than say your standard, you know, tablet or computer. You know, in those cases, a lot of the times you're looking for, you know, the more of whatever spec is better and you're looking for that bigger number or what have you. And sometimes those dynamics just don't play out with e-ink. So my number one tip is don't worry about RAM. So RAM is something that definitely comes on every e-ink device. It can range from one gigabyte. I think the highest I've seen is six. I'm trying to remember if there was an eight gigabyte device out there. If not, I'm sure there will be one sometime soon. But RAM isn't nearly as important as you might think it is. You know, some devices, for example, with one gigabyte of RAM may seem very skimpy versus another with six, but the software is optimized for that level of RAM, and so it won't factor in at all. Recently, books uh, released devices with six gigabytes of RAM, but honestly, uh, just a year ago, one of their flagship models had four gigabytes, and I never ran up against that limitation. 
you know, RAM is one of those things is either you use it or you don't use it. If you don't use it, you get no benefit from it. So if you're not maxing out RAM, you don't really need additional RAM. And that's true in computers as well. But I think more so on e-ink tablets, you know, they're just, RAM is rarely a bottleneck and getting additional RAM rarely makes a lot of sense. So if you're looking at devices and they start advertising six gigabytes or eight gigabytes of RAM, it's not as important as you might think. It is more important if you're considering, you know, Android tablets, for example, that play Google Play apps. RAM is much more of a factor there, and that's where you're moving outside of the core system. So you might have additional demands on RAM. But again, I had a four gigabyte device just a year ago, and I never felt like there wasn't enough RAM. So generally speaking, you don't need to pay attention to this particular um, aspect of the devices and don't chase the large numbers of RAM. They're not as important as you might think. So kind of in a similar vein to RAM are processors. Now it is true that the faster the newer the processor, it will have a difference on the device. The problem is that the real limiting factor isn't necessarily the processor speed, it's really the technology of the screen itself which is that limiting factor. So having an additional processing capacity doesn't always equate to actual performance. And when it does, a lot of the times it tends to be fairly nominal, you know, not that significant, frankly. Um, so looking at the specs on processors generally doesn't help you and it's something you can generally ignore. It doesn't mean there's no impact. I do think there is a little bit of a one, but generally speaking, if you look at a lot of these devices, they're using older generation processors anyway. There's really no devices out there that has like the latest processor. And again, it's because of that limitation of the screen technology itself. I would argue that storage capacity is also another area that probably isn't as important as you might think. And I'll give you an example of why. I have used a SuperNote for, gosh, three years now, and I've accumulated about 13 gigabytes roughly of notes over those three years, and that's through daily use at work. So I have plenty, with a 32 gigabyte uh, device, that leaves plenty of capacity for additional expansion. Now, the story might change a little bit if you're bringing on a lot of documents onto your device that you want to annotate on, and then storage might start to become more of an issue. But generally speaking, I would argue that if you're looking at 64 gigabytes or more, you're, you've got plenty of storage available to you, and it's really only a small number of people that are going to need a lot more storage than that. Um, I've never come anywhere near maximizing storage. Again, mainly because I'm just doing note taking, not as much document annotation, but even with documents, um, you just have to put a ton of these documents on these devices for that to even matter. So if you have 64 gigabytes or more, you're in great shape. Um, and I wouldn't put a lot of thought into that. Again, unless you're really on the edge where you're just putting tons of documents in and that's going to that 5% that I talked about earlier. But for most people, 64 is enough. Coming in at number four is probably my more controversial item on this list, and that's regarding pixel density. Now, I'm not arguing that pixel density doesn't matter, but I think that it matters less to most people than you might think. So I'll just give you some examples. If you have a black and white device and your focus is on reading and writing, the primary uses for these e-ink devices, it's hard to tell the difference of a device that is around, say, 217 PPI versus 300 PPI. And 300 is about as high as it goes right now. In fact, I'm not aware of any e-ink device with a higher pixel density than that. Now, it's not that you don't notice differences. I mean, there is a certain sharpness to 300 PPI, but it's more incremental than you might think. And if I'm reading, for example, say a book on a 227 or a 217 PPI device, I don't really notice it. It doesn't come out for me. Same with writing. Writing does not require a particularly high pixel density. Um, so writing lines looks just fine uh, with a wide range of that density. Now, when we start talking about images, that's when you really start to notice the difference. And for example, you know, on color devices, particularly Kaleido 3, 
where the color is at 150 ppi, you definitely start to notice that in images and in certain graphic designs. So it's not that pixel density doesn't matter, but I think it quickly reaches diminishing returns, particularly around the 200 ppi level. Now, some people are particularly sensitive around pixel density, and they would argue differently. And of course, they would be right for them. Um, but I think for most people, you know, the early 200s is still really good um, and would suffice. So I think pixel density is something you don't have to worry too much about. Again, unless you start talking about looking at images or using your tablet um, as kind of more of an Android device, and then that pixel density will factor in more in those cases. Okay, coming at number five is front lighting. And unlike the other categories we've talked about before, front lighting could be really important to you. That's something you do need to consider. Sometimes people get hung up though. Sometimes people think, oh, I have to have front lighting or I don't have to have front lighting, which is which. And this is one of the more difficult decisions that I think people have to make about their device. The good news here, and my advice to you, is that front lighting really matters depending on your environment. So I'll give some examples. So in work, um, I've worked either with the fluorescent lights on or off and just ambient light coming in through the window. In either of those situations, I've never felt the need to have front lighting on my note-taking device, and I use a super note. Now, if it was dark outside and I didn't have the lighting on in the room, that would be a situation where I would need front lighting. In addition to that, the current lighting I have right now in my study, it's a little bit higher than it normally would be because I have a ring light as well as my normal torchery. But even with just the torchery, I can take notes in this environment without front lighting. Now, reading is an area where I tend to find I need front lighting a little bit more. And that's because I tend to find myself reading in environments that are more comfortable and the lighting isn't always as great. In addition to that, Kaleido 3 devices, these are the color devices. Um, most e-ink screens come with Kaleido 3. Only uh, currently, the Remarkable Pro has a different color technology called Gallery 3. But for Kaleido 3 screens, those are inherently darker because of the color layer. And so you would find yourself needing front lighting in that situation a bit more. Although I could do note taking without front lighting on that device as well in the environments I just talked about earlier. So in other words, it's a little bit device specific, but it's really environment specific. So whether you need front lighting or not really depends on the lighting situation of where you're going to be using your devices. One rule of thumb I like to tell people that I think is helpful is just take a book and read that book in different environments and find out if you can read it without any additional lighting. If you don't need additional lighting and you can read it comfortably, then you probably don't need front lighting. But if you can, uh, you do need some additional lighting or you've got to angle the book in certain ways, then you would really probably want to consider front lighting as part of your device. So front lighting is important. It just depends on the circumstances and where you're using your device. If you're using in places where you've got good lighting, then you don't need it. If you're using them in places where maybe lighting isn't quite as good, then you would definitely want to consider including that on your device. So as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, um, I do fairly deep reviews on devices, and there are a number of other YouTubers that do deep reviews as well. So that's the good news. There's actually quite a few uh, YouTubers like myself talking about these devices and sharing different perspectives. So someone who is interested in a device can learn a lot about them through these YouTube videos. But there's also, unfortunately, another truth about that. And that's that no matter how much information we can share with you, nothing replaces the actual experience of working with the device. So that leads to my sixth tip for you, which is definitely keep returns in mind. No matter how much you may think you like a device based on someone's review, you may end up getting it and almost immediately going, this is terrible and this is not for me. And there's no way to know that until you receive the device. So at that point in time, your best friend is a shopping outlet with a good return policy. Amazon historically has had a fairly good return policy. I'm not sure where they are lately. I just haven't kept up to speed with that. 
Um, and there are other resellers as well. Just look into their policies. Some companies have 100 day return policies. Um, Remarkable, for example, I think has by reputation a pretty good return policy. Some companies have horrible return policies. Books, for example, um, is incredibly difficult to do a return. You have to do a restocking fee and so on. So you just want to do a little bit of research and make sure that wherever you're buying the device has a good return policy. And if you decide that device isn't for you, you can send it back with minimal hassle. Now, there are some disadvantages uh, to that. So we'll use Books as an example. Books has a terrible return policy, but you can get better deals if you buy directly from them. A lot of time the case is included. Sometimes there are extra things like, you know, uh, nibs that are included as well. So there is a disadvantage to not going um, directly to the manufacturers, but if you're not sure whether you're gonna like the e-ink device, it's better to be safe than sorry and purchase from someone that you can return that device quickly if that's what you end up deciding to do. So my final tip for this video, um, and again, I can't emphasize that enough that I'm speaking in generalities, is I'm just gonna give you a few places to look depending on what your interests are. So let's say, for example, you're just focused on note-taking. That's really your emphasis. Well, the two brands that you should focus on are Supernote and Remarkable. Remarkable in particular is ultra-focused on note-taking. They do document annotations as well, but they're definitely curating their note-taking experience. And a super note, I think, excels with note-taking. Of course, they do other things as well. They have a drawing app on the device. You have Kindle on the device. You can sideload apps. But I do think that those two manufacturers in general cater to the writing experience. So those are the two companies I would look at if you were narrowly focused on note-taking. If you were focused on note-taking, but also using applications like, you know, from Google Play, the two companies I would focus on are Books and Viwoods. Both companies um, have really good note-taking apps as well, but they also have access to the Google Play Store on the device, so you don't have to sideload, um, and it works fairly well uh, with each. Books has a little more options in terms of a wider range of devices, and they have color devices as well, but the Viwoods devices are excellent and worth considering. So I would look to those two companies if your focus was more on an Android tablet in addition to the writing experience. Lastly, if your focus is mostly on reading and you wanna do some writing on the side, like for example, you wanna do journaling or you wanna do kind of simple writing, as, and just have one device to handle both of those tasks, then I would look to Kobo and Kindle for those types of activities. Um, they have devices, the Scribe for uh, Kindle, and for Kobo, um, they have a, a number of devices. The larger one is the Ellipsa 2E, but they have smaller devices as well. Um, and those are nice devices if you're reading focused, but you want some note-taking ability. The most important thing to note here is that, and the good news, I think, is that all those companies I just talked about make really good devices. So the odds of you getting a device that's, that's a good device is really high. You really shouldn't stress about the decision. Your focus really is more about what are my preferences and which device aligns the best with them. So if you don't get the best device for you, you still have a high probability of getting a really good device as well. So don't freak out. I do suggest doing a little bit of, of research. It will be helpful just to make sure you make that first choice the right choice. But if you don't land the perfect choice for you, you'll still end up in a pretty good place um, most of the time, in my opinion. So those are just some tips to make your life a little easier if you're looking at an e-ink device for the first time. I hope those help. If you have any questions, pop those into the chat and I will try to answer them the best I can. Or if I don't have the answer, I'll try to refer you to some place that does. And uh, good luck to you, and uh, I highly recommend these e-ink devices for both reading and writing. So if you're considering one, I think you're on the right track, and I'll do whatever I can to help you get there. All right, thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day.